I'm the director of the North Carolina Science Festival. I'm the senior manager of programs and strategic partnerships um, at Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center, an organization I'm incredibly proud to work with and work for. Um, behind the scenes, we have the festival manager, Eric McIntosh, who has been pulling all-nighters as we pivot to a, a virtual statewide celebra celebration of STEM. We also have Dr. Amy Sale, who will be talking to us a little bit about what's in the night sky, because what would a Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center program be without a little bit of astronomy? Um, so I said, I'm Jonathan. I do want to point this out, because one thing others, others of you out there have probably noticed that Zoom chats can be kind of, kind of funky. I'm in a corner of my house. This is a portrait of our beloved cat painted by uh, my mother-in-law, um, based on uh, actually an Alexander Hamilton portrait, believe it or not, but that's Tonka. He passed away just a, a few weeks ago, RIP, but uh, I just figured I like him looking over my shoulder, making sure I'm doing a good job. If you hear any screaming or crying, those are my three and five-year-olds who are just kind of upstairs that way, eating some popcorn and watching a movie, and they may pop in, who knows, but um, we wanted to keep things going. This event normally takes place at a, at a bar, so if you haven't grabbed your favorite cocktail or beverage or quarantine snack of choice, feel free to do so before we get to the main attraction. So you can see on the screen there, Brian, I, I have some moonshine right here. No, this is, this is water. I'm going light tonight, but um, we'll, we'll get really, really going here in a few minutes. But first, um, I just wanted to say uh, that we're all in this together. We're in uncharted territory where we're thinking about you and we're with you and we hope you're doing a, uh, okay in these strange times of, of physical distancing and a, and a global pandemic. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We do want to thank our regular partners. Um, Top of the Hill is an incredible restaurant in Chapel Hill. Back Bar is normally where we host these events every uh, first Wednesday of the month and they do an incredible job. So we hope that team's hanging in there. We can't wait to get back to you. Um, and we also want to thank, of course, uh, UNC's chapter of Sigma Xi, who normally at Back Bar contributes a little bit of money to uh, some appetizers. So uh, I tried to talk them into shipping personal packets of appetizers to everyone's home, but that, <laughs> that was logistically complicated and probably wouldn't be a best practice during a pandemic. So um, feel free to eat the nachos uh, from your lap uh, as, we, as we dive in here. Um, and also our parent entity, uh, UNC Chapel Hill and Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center, uh, it's been such an incredible uh, thing to witness how our team sort of adapted and morphed and how we're still passionate about trying to meet our mission. And because of that, and because we're known for astronomy, I've noticed on a few of my nighttime walks that there's some pretty cool stuff in the night sky. So I brought along one of the, uh, it's like if you were to design an X-Man for what we do, you would want, in this current world, you would want someone with public health training and astronomy training. And we have Dr. Amy Sale, who is an epidemiologist by training, but she loves the stars and the night sky and cosmology so much. She works with us and we have the pleasure of working, uh, working with her. So I wanted her to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's in the night sky so that after this, if the clouds part a little bit, you may be able to get a little bit of fresh air and, and, uh, and, and look up and see what's up there. So Amy, take it away and tell us what we can see. All right, thanks, Jonathan. Um, hi, everybody. I am incognito uh, visually right now, which is a shame because I actually washed my hair for you all. Um, but what I want to do is encourage you um, after we're, we finished our science cafe to put your screens away, get yourself outdoors, six feet apart, of course, and then take a moment to connect with nature by looking at the sky. Get yourself a new perspective. Remember that we live on a tiny part of a big planet. That's part of a solar system, that's part of a galaxy, that's part of a universe. And when you go outside, I'm gonna suggest three things that you look for. And I'm gonna share my screen to show you the first thing to look for. And some of you may have noticed this already this afternoon, if you were out. Um, you saw the moon, it rose this afternoon. And um, if you go out also after the sunset, you will see it. It uh, was first quarter this morning, so it's still looking pretty much half illuminated. And then once the sky has set and it starts to get dark, you're gonna look for a planet. So this is a, a screenshot from Stellarium and it represents things that are bright with big dots. So see if you can find the planet, it's Venus and it's brighter by far than any star in the night sky. So give yourself a moment. See if you can find it, and there it is. So um, look in the same direction that the sun set soon after the sunset, and you'll see it. 
And just to give you a little close up view, if you have a telescope, you might point it towards Venus sometime, you'll see it actually goes through phases like the moon. And then once you found the moon and you found Venus, see if you can find a star cluster that Venus is hanging out near right now. And I'll let you look around for a moment on your own. See if you can find it. It's the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. And there it is. Venus is closing in on it. Um, it'll actually be quite close by April 3rd. Give you a close up of that. Um, if you have binoculars in particular, take a look at the Pleiades. It's a really stunning sight, um, although it will not look quite like this through your binoculars or your telescope. And just one final thing to point out, um, you notice how close Venus and the Pleiades look right now. They are not actually close. They are practicing very good distancing. Um, the Venus being a planet, it's just millions of miles away from us on Earth. The Pleiades, stars, trillions of miles away. Um, and by the way, if it's not clear tonight, tomorrow night, the prediction is for clear skies over the entire state of North Carolina. So take a look. Thank you. All right, excellent job as usual, Amy. Thank you so much. And we'll be doing a lot more of that um, in the coming weeks and months as we tap into our core experts at Moorhead to celebrate astronomy and bring as much content to you as we can. Additionally, um, our website, ncscifest.org, we've started to populate it with all sorts of virtual interactions and we hope to add more like our Science Cafe series. The way our cafes usually work, is they are uh, an opportunity to connect an expert um, to an audience in an informal setting, and it's not necessarily meant to be a lecture. We encourage questions, and because we're in a virtual format, um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Zoom, we do want to give you a quick tutorial on how you might be able to do that. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric McIntosh, our festival manager, to just explain very quickly how we can uh, let you ask Brian some questions. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Zoom webinars, um, there's kind of two ways to give us feedback. One is to use the chat, which only us panelists can see. That's myself, Jonathan, Brian, and Amy. Um, that's a good way to leave us comment feedback, um, anything you're thinking about. Uh, the other way is to use the Q&A function, which uh, for most of you is probably on the bottom of your screen, but depending on which device you're using, it may be up top or somewhere else hidden. Um, it's a big thing that says Q&A. Um, so you can use that to submit questions and we'll be monitoring that throughout the talk and um, feeding those to uh, our presenters for, uh, to answer. So use those and um, if you have any uh, issues or tr troubles or technical things, go ahead and put those in the chat and we can try to address those as well. So thank you all, enjoy the talk. All, all right, so I think we're ready. Um, I know our presenter has some, uh, ways to test your interactivity and he's gonna he's gonna put you to the test but i was personally very excited uh that dr brian southwell was was up for doing this um we've been having we've been having some robust conversations around um, what's happening with the global pandemic and information and misinformation as and as what happens so often in north carolina um there are some leading experts right nearby who are who are passionate about uh outreach and connecting with the public um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Brian Southwell. Um, he is the Senior Director of Science in the Public Sphere Program in the Center for Communication Science at RTI International. And I should mention that RTI International is a sponsor of the North Carolina Science Festival. Um, in addition to that, uh, Dr. Southwell is an adjunct professor and Duke RTI scholar with Duke University. He's taught courses in sociology, public policy, and documentary studies. Um, he's also a graduate faculty member in media and journalism and an adjunct associate professor of health behavior at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, Dr. Southwell's contributions appear in more than 100 journal articles and chapters and his various books, including Misinformation and Mass Audiences, uh, published by the University of Texas, and Social Networks and Popular Understanding of Science and Health have been based in social science research. He also is the host of a public radio show, The Measure of Everyday Life for WNCU. So we're very pleased to have Brian here, and he has a, a pretty provocative presentation for you. So with that, take it away, Brian. Great. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Thanks, Eric. Um, I, I really I am mean, impressed, and I appreciate um, all the effort that went into uh, making this happen. Uh, events like this obviously are, are increasingly going to be really important to all of us. So, um, so thank you for taking the time uh, to join us. Uh, there's a lot that we can talk about, uh, you know, here tonight. Um, maybe this ends up being part of a longer conversation, though, even beyond tonight uh, as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, um, and I'm going to check in with Eric and Jonathan to make sure that that's uh, working here. Uh, in just a moment. Okay. 
All right. And I just, if I get a thumbs up or confirmation from, uh, from Jonathan that we're good to go. Okay, great. Well, I, I again, um, I really, um, it's an honor to, to talk with you all uh, at the moment. Um, I, it's not hard to understand why we might want to come together to talk about misinformation, you know, in these recent days, uh, you know, many of us, I think, in talking with relatives on the phone or, um, you know, browsing our own social media feeds, um, probably stumbled across some piece of uh, inaccurate information uh, with regards to coronavirus that uh, has been troubling uh, you know, to us. Uh, you know, here's an example um, that some of you might have seen, uh, and again, Lots of caveats here that this is not accurate information, but um, there was you know, recently a, a post that um, that spread fairly far uh, with regards to the utility of, of drinking water uh, regularly as a way of protecting against uh, COVID-19. And I'm I'm interested, um, you know, if some of you might have uh, you know ideas uh, about. Um, other pieces of, of misinformation that you've seen. Uh, and here's a place where we can use the chat function. Uh, if you wanna just type in uh, a few uh, here that, that come to mind uh, and uh, we'll take a look at those and I'll, I'll offer a few of those uh, here. I'm just curious if any immediately um, pop up. Let's take a look. So we've already got um, you know, some concerns about uh, elderberry syrup, uh, per perhaps here as an uh, antidote. Uh, wow, well, the, <laughs> the chat is uh, overflowing now with um, ideas uh, here uh, already. Uh, gargling salt water, uh, potentially as, uh, as a curative measure. Uh, we've got also um, concerns here, uh, a lot of humorous comments um, you know, as well. And, um, some different mis misconceptions about um, you know, ibuprofen, um, reporting on that that's gone back and forth. Okay, so we, we've, we see lots of examples and we can, uh, and we'll collect and look at these even a bit further, uh, you know, as well. I'm interested though, um, you know, for all of you, as you think about, um, you know, this issue, whether or not you know, misinformation is something that's really just plaguing us you know, here in 2020, um, or if this has been a longer standing concern. Uh, and uh, this is something that I, I wanna broaden our lens here just for a moment. Um, and think about even just the last you know, year or two, even prior to um, you know, this pandemic, uh, we've been worried and concerned uh, about misinformation. In fact, a number of media outlets uh, have uh, pronounced uh, misinformation or some variant thereof as word of the year or as phrase of the year. And um, I think there are a number of reasons why we're concerned about this. We're concerned that this, in this information can um, you know, spread uh, relatively quickly. Uh, we're concerned that this is gonna undermine decision-making and we're concerned that there just seems to be so much of it out there um, you know, right now, that this is a way of characterizing you know, the moment uh, in terms of you know, thinking about inaccurate information. Part of what I want to do, though, today is help to put all this in context, um, just offer some ideas about why um, you know, misinformation might actually be a, a concern that's been with us for a while and, and why it's not going anywhere. And then also let's talk a little bit about what we can do about it and um, you know, turn our attention to more of a hopeful um, you know, frame on this. So it turns out that um, we've actually been worried and concerned about misinformation for, um, for quite a while. If you look back uh, over the past century, um, there are a number of different examples here um, you know, that pop to mind. Um, even you know, the run up to the, and the years prior to the Spanish-American War, um, there was concern about um, inaccurate journalism uh, you know, that was potentially uh, sparking um, you know, some of the, the sentiments. Uh, if you look in the late 1930s um, you know, in the US, uh, there's a famous example on a, a fall evening um, in the late 1930s um, when a number of people missed the introduction uh, to a radio drama and um, got the impression instead that Martians were in fact uh, invading New Jersey. I'll offer no comment as to whether or not um, you know, that actually could ever be true, um, but of course it wasn't. It, this was um, you know, a dramatization of H.G. Wells' novel, War of the Worlds. And it, and it woke people up to the idea that you know, these electronic boxes that we have in our living rooms actually are vectors potentially for not just um, accurate information, but also misinformation. And there's been a lot of examples of this around the world. Um, in fact, I had the chance um, in, a while back um, to, to learn about the story of a woman named Belle Gibson. Belle Gibson um, is somebody who rose to fame in Australia. And uh, she, in a lot of ways, embodies 
the story that I want to tell here and some of the takeaways that we might have with regards to misinformation. Bell Gibson um, is a, a, an advocate, was an advocate for um, a nutrition-based cure uh, for cancer. And um, as it turns out, unfortunately, uh, Belle Gibson, uh, she had told her own story and told how she had overcome uh, you know, cancer through um, you know, various uh, nutritional means. It turns out, unfortunately, that um, she never had cancer um, and the whole thing was a fraud. And this was something that really shook uh, Australians in a lot of ways because she had risen to such fame. Um, she had a lot of social media followers. She was a prominent figure. Um, and this was something that was uh, led to a lot of hand wringing. Um, and it, it still actually is a, a topic of conversation there. There have been legal ramifications for what she did. And we can you know, certainly look at it just as a straight um, you know, instance of fraud. But I actually think what's compelling about the Bell Gibson story is the fact that she ever rose to such prominence in the first place. You, you can't rise to prominence without there being an audience. And so what does the Bell Gibson story tell us about ourselves? What does it tell us about um, you know, how much we pay attention to folks that are savvy um, in their media presentation, to photogenic um, you know, individuals, to people that have a compelling story about a topic that we care deeply about and that we're worried about? And so in a lot of ways, I think actually we probably misunderstand our own vulnerabilities. And by this, I mean all of us. I mean that all of us actually are vulnerable to, um, to misinformation in a number of different ways. There are at least two observations that um, I'd like to make, two elements and you might think of as, as a recipe for um, you know, the spread of misinformation. Um, the first is this observation that um, we need social connection. We are social beings, and we're learning that. Uh, we're really craving, um, you know, that kind of social connection, you know, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and so, obviously, this is quite salient for us. It's also the case that we need hope for the future, um, or else uh, it's hard for us to move forward and operate. It's fascinating, um, you know, how much both of those needs are really apparent to all of us, uh, you know, here in the last couple of weeks. And so, it's it's probably no surprise then, or it wouldn't be anyway, if, if you really thought about it, um, that we'd be in a situation where misinformation can spread. Because I think in situations where um, we're both lacking in social connection and perhaps lacking in hope, uh, that is what I think um, can lead to the diffusion of misinformation because of the role that misinformation can play in our lives, to the value that it, it can offer. It turns out that um, we are in a situation in terms of understanding misinformation where um, we don't actually have all the answers yet. Uh, we actually are just in the beginnings of really robust empirical work uh, you know, here, but I've had the good fortune of um, you know, entering into that uh, with a new book that we have out uh, called Misinformation and Mass Audiences. And putting that book together was, was interesting um, in lots of ways, but partly it was challenging because we brought people together from so many different disciplinary areas and had to get people talking and using the same vocabulary, thinking about things in the same way. And then once we did that, um, all the different contributors, I think, realized um, you know, some of the areas of commonality um, that misinformation is partly a function of our human psychology, partly a function of the systems that we put together, and partly not necessarily specific to individual topics, although there are ways in which certain topics do seem to be more predisposed. We've also um, written about this, uh, I've written about this with uh, National Cancer Institute colleagues. Um, there are ways in which we complain and bemoan misinformation, and some of it I don't think is actually fully accurate. Um, there are instances in which you know, any of us could go out there and find some crazy the outlandish piece of, of misinformation on the internet. I'm not sure that all that matters you know, equally. I think that there are certain types of misinformation that are probably more consequential than others. Um, and that's something that we uh, certainly need to, um, to think about. Um, it's certainly the case uh, with regards to thinking about COVID-19 um, and coronavirus. Um, some of what the examples that we might find are uh, particularly, you know, um, dramatic, but they may not be getting a widespread audience, and they may not have you know, direct public health consequence, whereas others, I think, are actually having um, an impact. Um, if you're recommending that people drink bleach, and, and then people do that, that's really a, a problem. Hey, Brian, um, so, can, I, can yeah. I interrupt you there for one second, because I yep. see a question that's sort of around, like, people doubling down on their beliefs. I, I wonder if it gets to sort of the, the, the idea that, um, that I guess it's the backfire effect is what came to mind is where like the more evidence you present to people or make a data driven argument, the more they kind of cling to their belief. And so anything you present almost becomes part of the conspiracy against yeah. that would change their belief. So is there, 
Um, yeah. Are you researching that or how do you research something like that or how? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so actually, and that, that cues up um, the next slide uh, here very well. Uh, and so thank you for that question, because um, there are some observations that we've made based on empirical you know, research in this arena where we have done everything from you know, present um, misinformation to people and then attempted to correct it to un try to understand the diffusion and flow of, of misinformation in different ways. We've come to a number of conclusions here that I think both speak, you know, Jonathan, to that question um, and also suggest why this is a going to be a persistent problem um, you know, for us. There is a pathway forward. There are things that can be done, but um, there are certain ideas that we ought to accept uh, with regards to human psychology. So let me just kind of quickly walk through each of these because I, I think these are important for the discussion we might have. Um, the first is that actually turns out, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about rival um, psychological models as to what happens when we encounter a piece of false information, um, there's been a longstanding debate about this. And there's some models that suggest that we actually are able to screen out, um, you know, false information based on our, you know, critical, you know, thinking. And then there's others that are subtly different. And it turns out that um, that latter uh, model is, is what seems to be the case, which is that we actually accept information at face value initially, at least for a moment. And then we tag it as being false or true using our critical faculties. Turns out that um, unfortunately, sometimes we're not in a good position. We're, we're tired. We've got you know, kids screaming in the other room. We've got other things going on. We might let our guard down. Um, and that might be uh, for just long enough to click uh, to share something on Facebook, for example. And so the fact that we actually initially accept most information at face value and then only then are, are trying to um, you know, do something with that that's a vulnerability. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't be critical and we can't, uh, we are, uh, and we are able to make judgments, but we're not always doing that and not everybody's always doing that. Um, it also turns out that there are lots of reasons why we share information and, and misinformation. Some of it has to do with wanting to um, you know, present factually accurate information, but some of it just has to do with bonding with other people. The best mm -hmm. example that comes to mind here um, for me is one that unfortunately now seems like a, a really pleasant you know, memory, um, but it's just the example of when you get into an elevator and you see somebody else you know get into that elevator and you both um, have a conversation about the weather. Well, you were both just outside and yet you're both talking about the weather. And so you're not necessarily sharing new information. Why are you talking at all? Well, partly you're doing that just to acknowledge the other person, to say, hey, you're part of my you know, community. And I think we see the equivalent of that online quite a bit, where people are signaling that they're part of each other's tribe, that they're part of each other's community. And it, even if it means sharing information they haven't fully fact-checked, or even if, it's, even if it's information that turns out to not be fully true, if there's something about that information that resonates in terms of you know, that shared identity, that can be another reason. So this notion of information and misinformation as relationship currency, as part of the you know, stuff that gets you know, passed back and forth just to show people that they're bonded, that's part of what the situation is um, that we're facing as well. It also turns out that in places like the United States, um, we have regulatory structures in place to oversee our communication. But those regulatory structures are what we might call post hoc in their um, you know, detection. In other words, we tend to recognize and find um, problematic misinformation, uh, especially in broadcast television and some other you know, environments like that. And, and we ask you know, for something to be done about it. But our situation is not one where we have um, you know, an environment that's sanitized and censored. And I think that's a good thing, you know, obviously. Um, but our, our, our environment is what we might think of as leaky in some ways. So it's possible for things to especially end up on the internet, but even on TV, even into print, um, that only are going to be corrected retrospectively. And so that means that was printed just because it was on TV, just because it was in the internet, on the internet doesn't mean obviously that you can um, necessarily believe it. The last goes to Jonathan, the point that you just raised, which is that we know that it's possible to correct misperceptions. It is possible. But to do that, um, you need to be very explicit and direct and immediate. And it's, that's not often going to be the case. And so um, it is possible for there to be entrenched um, you know, beliefs. 
I think that some of the literature on that's a little bit overstated and for some different ways because of the nature of the self-report. I think that sometimes what people are expressing in terms of not changing their belief is actually a political expression, um, you know, that they are saying, you know, that they're going to double down on this, but whether or not they actually have been affected by the corrective information is, is still somewhat of an open question. But nonetheless, we know you have to be pretty explicit about it. You can't just have a um, sort of very heavily, uh, you know, a very nuanced and, and heavily caveated um, you know, post on a web page somewhere and expect that that's going to counter, um, you know, a, fa a false, you know, um, claim in an internet or a, a Super Bowl ad, you know, and so uh, that's something that you have to fight fire with fire. And we found that that's to be the case. Um, it's also worthwhile, I think, for us to think about our human nature uh, with regards to um, the psychology of, of rumors. This is something I had a chance to write about, you know, a few years ago. Um, in a book uh, where we're looking at how and why information spreads, you know, more broadly, you know, through social networks. And um, something that we found was that uh, there are certain preconditions, certainly in situations where there's uncertainty. Um, and we know that people are uncomfortable with that. So people are going to try to uh, make sense of and to resolve that uncertainty any way they can. They're going to try to grasp for whatever answers that they might. And misinformation sometimes fills a bill when there's no other information, especially when there's a lack of official, uh, officially sanctioned, sanctioned corrective information out there. And as I say that, the current situation probably comes to mind, um, that this is a situation where we've got a tremendous amount of uncertainty and not necessarily all of the information that we might want, although some official sources have done, I think, um, a, a good job in trying to get um, information out you know, relatively quickly. It's also the case, to harken back to that earlier idea, that sometimes it's not facts that people are trying to share with each other at all. It's just that they're trying to signal um, you know, their connection. And that is gonna be a recipe for rumors to spread and for misinformation to spread. Gotcha. Do you um, think, so I've seen a few things today, I think maybe Politico ran a, an article about, um, you know, the where kind of a, a recap of kind of how things have flown in terms of information or, or flowed in terms of information with, with the COVID-19 situation. And they're, they seem to be um, using any sort of refinements in the CDC's messages as evidence of incompetence. And I thought, yeah. well, science doesn't necessarily work that way, right? Yes. I mean, there's times when you have better information, you're gonna tweak your message. But in the politicized environment, that's gonna come across as you waffling or as you flaking. But um, yep. I think that's really, I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts along those lines. A abs absolutely. So I think part of, and, and this you know, helps us think about what can be done about all of this. Um, part of what we have to do, I think, is to get a better handle on what people understand about the scientific process. Um, and that I think, you know, we, uh, the notion of scientific literacy is not going to be a new one to many people listening in, um, you know, here. And yet, it takes on special importance here, because I think if there, there's, it's not just a matter of people understanding core concepts, but it's also a matter of understanding how the scientific process work, how scientific institutions work. The idea that iteration is part of science. The idea that it's okay for there to be, um, you know, uh, an evolving um, you know, set of, of ideas as, as the latest information, you know, comes in. And I think that goes partly to, um, you know, the trust that we see or don't see, um, you know, between different communities and, and scientific institutions. So I think part of what we need to do here, actually, is not a matter of just going on a fact-checking mission and, and squashing misinformation, but it's actually going to be a matter of um, building and rebuilding building trust um, you know, in institutions, so for it to be okay for people to understand how CDC operates, for people to understand how um, under a situation like this, we may well have the best leading edge of information um, change a bit you know, over time. Um, and and that's, uh, there's an interesting question, you know, this has come up with regards to official recommendations on masks and other things like that you know, too. And there's different viewpoints on this. But um, some of what's happening is, I think, uh, um, uh, lack of tolerance for um, you know some of these messages to um, to be iterative, and, and, but that can be disconcerting for people too. You know, you know to have things you know, sort of the ground constantly changing, especially by the hour. And so I think there are some best practices there that maybe haven't always been followed either. Um, you know, in terms of uh, you know constantly changing, seemingly minute to minute, you know what some of these messages are. So you know, Jonathan, I, I thought I might also talk a little bit about um, just for a few minutes, then we can open it up to questions. Just some examples of what might be done in that vein of um, kind of building community and trust. And part of what can be done, frankly, are events and initiatives just like you've been doing. 
for a while here. Um, I think that's really a, a, a part of it. Um, and in fact, this came up um, recently uh, I was in, uh, not recently, but you know, last year um, in Copenhagen uh, for the annual meeting of the European Science Museum Association, um, Excite. And I put together a, um, a two-day workshop for them that um, what's partly compelling about it is what we ended up calling it, um, which is beyond fact-checking. Um, and so much of the conversation with folks, and we've got representatives here from a, a variety of different science museums um, across Europe, um, part of what we ended up talking about was the it, with the utility of science museums as a place of community um, and what needs to be done to better support those institutions as they do community building. And so that's something that um, is, is, I think, uh, an interesting part of the equation here um, with regards to, um, you know, doing something about misinformation. I've also had a chance to put together um, a, a workshop and a summit um, you know, with regards to nonprofits and foundations. Uh, we did this at RTI International, um, you know, where I work, and we put together a, a white paper on this, where we generated a, a series of different initiatives and ideas, um, all in the vein of um, building and maintaining trust in science. We had Lee Rainey uh, from Pew uh, Research Center come down and he reminded us that there actually are great reservoirs of trust in, in different um, aspects of science. There are, there's great trust in one's own um, physician, for example. There's trust in, in different ways. So it's all hope is not lost here. Um, I think that gets overstated sometimes as well. But we're certainly going to have to work on this um, you know, going forward. I also wanted to point to just a few things that we were doing here locally. Um, we are working with some local community colleges um, and we're also working with uh, clinicians um, and realizing that there are lots of different um, players in this um, arena. So let me just quickly talk about that. Um, up in Rockingham Community College up near the Virginia border, uh, we're working right now with a, a, a special course designed for nurses, um, but that's focused on how it is that they can help um, their families, their patients, others navigate the health information environment. And our thought is that um, you know, by working with community colleges, we might be able to get into different communities in, in a really um, productive way um, and to work with different parts of the state. So we're looking forward to building out um, that as maybe an, a curricular offering for community colleges you know, across the state. Over at Duke, um, I've also worked with clinicians. And part of the takeaway there is that clinicians are part of the problem and part of the solution as well. Um, we've actually had uh, initially the thought that uh, you know, clinicians were sort of worried about all the misinformation that they were hearing from patients. And part of the issue is that they probably weren't being empathetic enough um, and sort of realizing the reasons why patients were bringing it to them in the first place. So we actually had a really compelling training um, where we tried to encourage empathy um, try to encourage uh, clinicians to understand why it is that people were interested in the misinformation that they were bringing to them, rather than just dismissing it out of hand, and to be working more collaboratively with them. And that, that message seemed to really resonate. And then even beyond some of the issues, um, you know, here we're constantly trying to ask the question, how can we use social science to help society? And one place where we're trying to do that over at Duke um, is on a, a new project that'll be coming up in the fall, uh, here based here in North Carolina on the, um, the dilemma of wildfires and where people turn to for trusted information in the context of wildfires. And that collaboration, um, we've got a number of really great uh, partners, different entities over at Duke. We're also working with the North Carolina office here of the Environmental Protection Agency, folks from the NC Central, uh, Rockingham Community College as well, and, and colleagues over at RTI. So we're gonna be trying to understand where it is that people do turn to, what sources of information they do trust, and trying to build from there, trying to meet people where they are, rather than trying to push out a um, hierarchical to a top-down message. Um, and we're hoping to learn quite a few, few things there. So, okay, so there's some initial thoughts. Um, I'd love to open it up further to questions, you know, Jonathan. Um, this might have yeah. hopefully sparked a number of different, uh, different things. Yeah, we have a few good ones. Um, one is from Hope, I Hope. Um, she wants uh, she wants you to possibly address access to quality information leading to unintended consequences. Um, she discussed this idea last week in a class regarding information surrounding COVID and the xenophobia and panic that could result from releasing more information about locations of cases, for example. So I think like, yeah, th those sorts of secondary consequences of, of this information overload. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts there? Yeah. So... <sighs> There's a number, I guess. Um, you know, we do, it's interesting in terms of a, a moment like this where um, on the one hand, it might seem like we are going to be more dependent than ever on, um, on the internet, on social media sites. 
at the same time, psychologically, um, I know that uh, for health reasons and for you know, well-being reasons, a number of people have started to step away. Um, you know, so it's, it's interesting in this moment when um, it would seem as though everybody's online all the time, actually you're finding if people are going out for walks or people are you know, trying to you know, connect there, that it may have a, um, an offset uh, in terms of, a, of an effect. Um, information overload is a real possibility um, you know, as well. We know that that makes it difficult for people to process any one piece of information. Uh, there are recommendations that, you know, in terms of limiting the number of sources to those that you've really been able to verify and trust and to limit your own diet, um, you know, media diet here that I think are, are um, important. Um, but there's, there's been a larger concern, um, you know, just in terms of the cynicism that might creep in. This is true sometimes with fact-checking efforts. This has been true in the political arena. You know, if it's the case that basically it seems like everybody lies all the time, well, then what's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence of that might be a, a real sense of um, you know, ennui, a real sense of um, not being able to believe anything and you know, having depression um, you know, sort of creep in. And I think we've, we've got to try to guard against that. Um, I tend to um, point people to the value of um, predictive information you know, over time. And what I mean by that is um, you look at certain information that was projected um, to come true. And some of those things will turn out to actually have been good predictions as a good indicator of like where it is you might continue to go back to for information. Unfortunately, you know, I think we see this play out with an issue like, you know, climate change where, um, you know, certain ideas that were announced and projected and forecast five, 10 years ago, you know, have come to be um, true. And I think, but that also suggests that those are, there are some credible places we might look. And so trying to look at information longitudinally a little bit um, you can help. I think that eventually, um, even though there's a mess of, um, of information, you don't know what to believe, there's all these competing you know, viewpoints, um, some of those are gonna turn out to be more accurate you know, over time. And so that gives, a, I, I think, I, and I think people are able to key into that um, you know, as well. So part of our worry and concern about what might seem like a jumble of um, an overload of information now, some things are gonna sort out. And I think you're gonna see certain uh, communities form around um, you know, some of these um, trust sources of information uh, you know, as well. So, but yeah. It, yeah, that's really well said because at some point expertise matters mm -hmm. and proof and evidence matters. And, you know, you know, you can have all your theories as to what turns on the light switch. But if you flip the switch and the light's not, eventually the light has to come on for people right. to keep backing that, whatever the view is, right? And, um, and it, it, nothing like a crisis, you know, for us to see that, you know, in reality. I mean, there's all this talk of a flattened landscape of, you know, everybody having their own truths and their own facts. Well, that's all well and good, but certain things are going to have tangible physical um, you know, effects that you can see. And, and I think that that, so we're actually in a moment where despite the enormous crisis, despite all of the tragedy, where we actually might see a, an elevation of expertise here um, in a way that could turn out to be helpful if we hold on to that um, as a habit uh, you know, moving forward. Well, since you're speculating. I know we wanted to <laughs> we wanted to avoid some speculation, but Miles asks an interesting question, and feel free to to you know answer this in yeah. a way that you feel comfortable with. But he asks, what effect do you think this pandemic will have on uh, people who are anti-vaccine, um, and do you think uh, this may change the way people who are against vaccines acknowledge what not having a vaccine for widespread illness does? Like, do you? It's tough to predict, but do you have a sense? It may, you may have already answered it just with what you said. You yeah, no, well, and I have to be careful here not to, I don't have you know, inside information as to what, what's going to happen in terms of vaccines and when are the jury's out you know, on that. But imagine that we were to find um, you know, one that, that worked. Um, I think over time that would bolster credibility. Um, and I think that you know, there are sometimes um, difficult but utilitarian arguments that, um, that need to be understood and made with regards to vaccines. And we may see that play out here that sometimes you know, it may be that there are some side effects, but they are offset by the, the greater you know, value. And, and so I think we're going to see more concrete evidence. And, and it, I do think it will have... Um, certainly an impact on, uh, on that. I think that understanding and being sensitive to those that have been hesitant about vaccines, that work and that literature, vital to us moving forward as well, if we do have a vaccine, because not everybody's gonna be equally okay in accepting it. Um, and I think that part of what 
And this goes back to a core message, a takeaway for tonight, you know, really, which is that empathy is going to be key. Empathy is going to be crucial for all of us. But that doesn't mean that you have to accept somebody else's false information as being true. There's a difference between respecting another person, respecting their values and how they got to um, a certain place in terms of being interested in or, or, or you know, even accepting some piece of information. That's different than um, saying, yes, I'm going to respect you to the point of saying what you're saying that is patently false is actually true. Wait, and you so, think I have to actually carve out a side <laughs> immediately, <laughs> be civil? Is that what you mean? Yes, exactly. I mean, that's, I, I think, and that, that, that's, really important to us, I think, in this moment. Uh, being kind, being civil doesn't mean um, not standing up for what you believe in, not doesn't mean that it peer-reviewed science doesn't matter, you know, anymore, but we don't have to be nasty about it. Okay? And, that, and I think that's something where many of us that work in the sci in different scientific communities, frankly, have looked our, down our nose a little bit at folks that haven't necessarily read all, all of our medical journals, right? And that's the wrong attitude as well. Um, I think that we, what we need to do is recognize everybody's interested in keeping themselves and their families and their, their communities healthy and strong. And people are tr doing their best to try to do that. Now, hopefully we can find ways, and I think there's, there's good evidence and information. We've got good um, tactics for doing that. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of um, first building a trusting you know, bridge between people before then just kind of, you know, uh, trumpeting uh, our our latest peer reviewed science, so there's work to be done on both sides of that. But um, but yeah, that's a great uh, it's a great point. I do think it is going to have an impact though on the on the polarization and civil and instability that's happening sometimes in some of those discussions. There's an interesting comment uh, from Wit about um, maybe the lack of knowledge about the scientific method could be impacting uh, messaging through through from scientists because they may use words like pol possible or they're looking for proof and evidence and if they haven't found it yet that doesn't mean the the converse is true um, yes. it just means they don't have the experiment hasn't been run and so they don't have the answers yet um, yeah. so uh, Witt is I, referencing that folks in this case uh, latched onto the word possible which is perfectly fair scientifically but not really effective in terms of regular everyday communication so there's a little bit yeah. lost there I, that's a great point. And I think that, you know, part of it is to have to, is for us to think about how, you know, scientists and researchers are socialized, you know, and we're socialized often to be extraordinarily careful, um, you know, in the language that we use. We might have had a, a, a fight back and forth with a peer reviewer, so, you know, through multiple iterations so that, you know, what's there is an exact, you know, statement. And then you go give the pre presentation regarding it and you're careful to just say that. We find that doesn't really work very well in a lot of um, you know larger, more popular media you know, formats and discussions. So, how to find that balancing act to be able to say something that is true, and yet something that resonates and is understandable for an audience that doesn't know all the vocabulary that went into that true statement? It's hard, and so I think this is a place where we need more um, translational efforts. We need more folks, frankly, and I don't mean this to just plug the kind of work that my colleagues at RTI do and other places and that, you know, Jonathan and others do, but we need the translators too. Um, I think that we need, and we need to recognize that there's room for very specific specialty and expertise and that folks probably can't necessarily always be coming straight out of their laboratory test tubes and speaking to a camera. And there's probably room, this is a hard issue. It's a hard for us to get a whole community and, and a whole population and society on board understanding the same thing. So we probably need to invest in more resources rather than less, um, you know, to educate folks and to recognize that it's okay if you didn't, if you don't have a PhD in, in chemistry for you to not understand this. It makes sense that you wouldn't and that we would need to work hard to try to get that trans Translated as well. So I think that that's, um, that, again, it's part of the empathy on both sides, I think. Yep. You have time for a couple more? You need to say yeah. right Okay, yeah, there's a, a good one about um, at what point, uh, you know, sometimes putting the onus on the consumer of the information. Um, at what point, how do we encourage people, uh, Todd asks, how do we encourage people to consider the veracity of sources before sharing it as a fact? And I know you touched on that earlier with like sort of a tribalism, and sometimes it's not even about the facts. But yeah. how do we encourage people to consider something being yeah well I, so I think there are some really basic messages that we could um, you know encourage and I think we're in, a, in an interesting moment with that now where we're sort of encouraging individual self you know, responsibility in terms of social distancing in terms of other you know certain basic things it, it's probably enough or it's at least a good start to tell people look it's fine if you want to share something with folks on social media use Google though and at least take a look and see if there aren't, um, you know, the algorithms uh, on a lot of these search engines are such that 
an awful lot of information is easy to find um, as being false pretty quickly. Um, and so part of it is just a matter of not operating just within any one social media platform and just pointing, clicking, sharing, but rather realizing that you have an obligation and responsibility for what you post. And if you do that, that you probably want to cross check it at least in terms of just checking to see if there's some other things out there, you know, that, that um, you immediately uh, seem like it's problematic. And so if, some, and if something seems to be too good to be true, you know, it probably is. And so just to check that out a little bit, it'd be amazing. It'd be, it's not going to get rid of all of it, um, but that would cut down on an awful lot. Just Google first, be careful. Don't just point and click. Tim has an interesting question. Um, regarding regulatory approaches in social media, have we entered a new paradigm of communication where there is no ownership of speech? Freedom of speech is meant to protect the speaker, but how relevant is this if there is no ownership? And is this a real or perceived problem? Yeah, a great question. Um, so on the, the show that, um, a public radio show that I host uh, actually over at WNCU, we recently had Phil Napoli um, from Duke on. Um, he's got a great new book on um, the regulation and potential regulation of social media. Um, he raises some of these concerns. Uh, the notion of authorship is an interesting one. You know, information just sort of gets out there in the miasma now and then you know, what ought we do about it. I think you're seeing um, some of the social media platforms, others kind of coming around to the idea that um, just because something flows through, you can't just not claim, you know, ownership of it that where it is that we might regulate it's not necessarily going to be just at the point of origin but also maybe on platforms is, is thinking about having some responsibility for what passes through um, maybe that's not perfect um, in terms of an absolutist you know um, perspective on free speech but that might be something that we move towards as a society um, you know to realize it's a really great the way you frame it i think is, is good for us to have that question um there are values there that we're going to have to decide on um you know collectively which of those we want to um you know elevate um and then i think there are implications of that but yeah folks like um you know phil um certainly tori extrand um, and others over in the school of uh, journalism and um and media uh, also at unc some other folks in media law they're doing some really great work on that so i encourage you to go look at that Here's a, uh, this might tap into some of the more philosophical leanings you may have. Yeah. Uh, Alan asks, does misinformation lead to misconceptions or are they intertwined? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, part of what's really insightful about that question is pointing out a distinction between um, you know, information and that which resides in our head. And there are folks that are going to argue that there's no distinction there, that basically it's all in our heads and, and that's, you know, there is a deeper philosophical, you know, uh, uh, issue. I personally, um, and I subscribe to the idea that um, there is something, there is information that exists outside of our sensory uh, you know, capacity, that there is a reality out there, um, and that we encounter it, that we are exposed to it, we make sense of it. Um, those things are not directly mirrors of one another, so um, I may not necessarily see everything with completely you know, an accurate lens. Part of what I'm bringing to the table is going to affect even how I perceive something, let alone you know, interpret it and store it and remember it. So we, all of that is the case. I tend to view communication as this really um, interaction, this intricate interaction between our individual psychologies and this wider environment. That's why studying it can be difficult sometimes because you really have to do work that um, incorporates both and accounting for what's actually out there and what's in our heads. Um, and I think only then do we really get to somewhere, um, the sort of multi-level interaction, somewhere really compelling. Interesting. That's great. I have a couple more that I'd like to get to. Um, okay. Bob asks, how does the recent emergence of actors that deliberately disseminate misinformation at scale change the challenging of countering that misinformation? And the example uh, he brings up is uh, the, the folks trying to create the counter narrative that the Australian wildfires were caused by arson, uh, and rather than to the attribu attribution to the effects of the climate change. Yeah, I think there are really important judgments to be made um, in instances where people are um, knowingly um, and unethically uh, disseminating information, and um, that's important. There, this goes though, actually in the book and in other places, we tend to talk about misinformation very consciously as an umbrella term. Um, that incorporates a lot of, some of it's just accidental noise that's out there, some of it's very intentional. What you're talking about, some people will refer to very specifically as disinformation. It might seem like a, um, you know, a, a nuanced you know, but a, you know, distinction, but I think that's important to think about that as a subcategory where we know that there is really intentional authorship, um, intentional um, you know, deception. And we tend to think that it can be tricky sometimes to know what authorial intention was. And so misinformation is sort of a better umbrella 
that covers everything, regardless of whether or not it was a mistake. You know, in the initial reporting um, for 9-11, um, you know, September 11th, uh, you know, 20 years ago, almost, um, we had, uh, I, I can remember distinctly, there were being reports of the National Mall being on fire, you know, and, and other, you know, it was, it was a, a momentary mistake in terms of the journalism, um, you know, and there are mistakes that happen, um, you know, and so some of that gets corrected, you know, and, and journalism itself can, can introduce some of this. But I think there is a special place for us to worry about, um, you know, folks that are intentionally uh, perpetrating some of this. And, um, you know, it's important to realize that just because we're speaking about all of it doesn't mean you can't have a special focus on um, and, and worrying concern about that. Um, there's a, an article in public health circles um, about um, you know, various bots that have attempted to try to pit um, different parts of uh, di different sides of the vaccine debate, um, you know, against each other intentionally through social media. And I, I, you know, a lot of that is ethically really problematic, obviously. Gotcha. Um, this is an interesting one from Howard. He asks about a half-life of lessons learned. It's sort of like, how do things get codified? Um, for example, lessons were learned uh, during the Spanish flu or polio, but over time, people seem to forget those lessons. So what happens with COVID-19 uh, may strengthen in the short term a belief in vaccines, but then after so long. So is there anything you're seeing and studying information and misinformation? That there's well, being I, I, actually, here's a place to comment on... Um, some of the I have deep respect, obviously, for my capital J journalism colleagues that you know that do this work. It's hard work. It's fast breaking. But there's been some breathless journalism. You know, even all of our talk of our situation being unprecedented, it it probably is in some dimensions. It's it's awful. But you know, New York City used to be shut down regularly for um, you know, epidemics. You know, we 1918 was was devastating. I mean, in, in terms of scope and scale, I don't necessarily mean to draw, you know, examples here, but there are, there are situations where we've had really problematic situations as a society. Um, and, and so part of the issue is the, um, you, you think about the lifespan and the capacity of, um, you know, journalists themselves. They are humans. Um, they are drawing upon drinking from a, a fire hose of, of ideas and facts and reporting that comes in. And just to realize that I, I, I do think that that happens, that we've got a, um, a, a cycle, an attention span that tends to um, not necessarily span, um, you know, decades. Um, and, Part of it is our sense that whatever newest um, must somehow be the best, that there's this um, false sense of the progression of history. And I think we probably need to do a better job of realizing that there were some really keen insights about the human condition made 100 years ago, 150 years ago, that still hold. Part of it is just the way that we um, you know, even tend to, to in, in scientific journals and in academia, um, privilege the latest um, you know, citations. But there are instances where we can learn from um, what's been written before. There's been some really wonderful you know, narrative history of different moments where, and I think it's our responsibility to be, not be afraid to bring some of that forward. And I think we might need to build that into some of the algorithms and some of the ways that we're presenting and seeing um, you know, social media and other places where uh, we're not afraid to kind of harken back and to bring some of this stuff forward. And maybe some of the folks on the phone can help do that. If you've got examples in mind, something, you know, if you are in your 80s right now, and you remember distinctly us being in a situation like this when we were, in, you know, when you were 35, and and things were written about it. And there things, people love to hear that content. It's really um, actually reassuring in a way. And I you, encourage you to bring it forward and to remind us of the fact that you know what we were here in 1956, and here's what we learned and thought about that, you know, then, and that might be a source of insight for us. So it'd be really ins inspirational if you could do that. So maybe some of you can do that. That's great. Um, and I think there's a nice comment here to close on because I think it speaks to we were talking about like what's the take home message uh, in our conversations leading up to this. So Ashley asks, um, she's concerned about the folks who really need this information aren't in the space hearing this kind of information. So, you know, we're yeah. preaching to the converted, preaching to the choir. How do we best maximize taking this information on misinformation forward? Um, you've touched on this already, but what else can we do other than being empathetic? in the face of misinformation. So I guess being too aggressive can backfire, yeah. but what are some strategies, I guess? It, yeah, can... well, it's gonna be difficult, um, but I think that this is something, and especially in a moment when it seems like we wanna, we wanna fix this in the, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I think part of what we have to do is take the long view here. Um, some of, we're going to have to depend on some of the relationships that we've built and we're going to have to start building some that are going to take a while. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, if somebody comes to you 
and the, it's the first time they've really talked to you in a while and they're asking you for a favor, it's really a turnoff, right? And it's really problematic. Similarly, if you're reaching out to your uncle or to somebody else that you know, that you see is spreading, or, or you're trying to get into a different community just to shut them down and to criticize their, their grasping of um, misinformation, that's not gonna go anywhere. And that's a bad idea to do that. So it's probably gonna be important for you to literally spend some time widening your circle, getting to know folks in those other areas, finding institutions. That's, that, that is at the heart of why we think working in, through the community college structure in this state could be important. And similarly, think about what can be done to build community, what could be done to um, build those spaces first and not lead with what can we do to stamp out misinformation about coronavirus. I don't think that's going to work. I think it's going to be a matter of what can we do to be talking to that neighbor of ours who we don't normally talk to, um, you know, and, and where can we start with kind of seeing how they're doing first. And that, that seems like a long suggestion, um, difficult to do, but I don't know if we have any other choice. And I think it would be, would be where, it's where we should go. But it's interesting because it speaks to sort of the world we're living in and the, and the need for social connection. Um, yeah. So we're in this time of physical distancing. We accidentally, I think, initially called it social distancing, yeah. physical distancing. Yeah. But we need to do things like this and, and to talk to people. Um, I appreciate everything you've said and really admire the work you're doing. Uh, do you have anything else you'd like to say to the people before we, we wrap up here? No, other than just um, not to be too uh, kumbaya about this, but really we ought to all be congratulating ourselves just taking time for an event like this. Like it, you're, you're doing something really important just by showing up right now. It's heartening to see a bunch of you online right now. Um, and we really appreciate that. It matters to us too. Um, and so keep doing it. Keep showing up. I think that Jonathan and the group there are onto something really special and important with this. Maybe there are ways that that could be expanded as a model. Um, and that's where I think we ought to go. And that has a surprising connection to, um, to the topic here. I think that's going to help us in reducing the spread of misinformation, but also building stronger communities. Couldn't say more. And, and for experts like you, Brian, to, to be willing to do this. So thank you. That's Brian Southwell. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we wanted to let you know that um, we hope to do more of this. And we do want to give you an opportunity to give us feedback. We're open to frank criticism, to ideas. Like, for example, I thought, what if we did a virtual book club and picked a science fiction book that maybe everyone has in their libraries or articles? So if you have ideas for things we can do or topics we can cover, um, please give us that feedback and let us know. And you can go to ncscifest.org to find more events that are happening virtually in this day and time. And uh, if you'd like to be added to our listserv, as it says on the screen now, you can type your email address in the chat box and we'll add you to the uh, Carolina Science Cafe listserv. And we'll do as many of these as you'd like. So take care, everybody. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you again, Brian. Excellent job. And Amy and Eric, uh, great job as well. Bye, everybody.